The Aldol reaction offers a powerful method to make larger molecules from smaller ones. As an example, the aldehyde on the left, where I've marked two carbons with blue dots, can be joined with another molecule of itself. The new carbon-carbon bond is here, and the product has a hydroxyl group on the third carbon and an aldehyde on the first carbon. So it's a three hydroxy aldehyde. In addition, the alkyl group that's attached to these first two carbons of the aldehyde ends up twice in the molecule. The mechanism for this reaction lets us easily understand how this happens. A hydrogen on the alpha carbon of one of the molecules of aldehyde is removed, making an enolate. And that enolate is a good nucleophile, so it adds to the carbonyl of another molecule of aldehyde. The reaction is finished when the initial product picks up a proton. Now here's an interesting thought. What if those two R groups were tied together? We would have a dialdehyde as a starting material, and the product would be a cyclic hydroxyaldehyde. This turns out to be a good way to make rings. There aren't that many good ways to make rings, so this is really important. Ketones generally don't do real well in aldol reactions for a variety of reasons. But for the intramolecular aldo reaction, ketones are usually the substrates, and it turns out they work really well under these conditions. Take a look at these examples. When you treat a symmetrical diketone with aldo conditions, you make a cyclic product. The size of the ring depends on the diketone you choose. The two carbonyls are equivalent, so let's just focus on one. We'll focus on the one on the left. And let's think about making the enolate at the alpha carbon that's a methyl group. That would put a pair of electrons here with a negative charge. And to do an intramolecular aldol, this carbon would have to reach around to that carbonyl. Now when we count the carbons, we see that if this enolate reacted, it would make an eight-membered ring. Ring sizes that are favored are five and six. Three and four are really strained and don't form. And beyond six don't form well either. So the enolate formed by losing a proton from the methyl group won't work well for an intramolecular aldol. But take a look at the other side. Now when we count the carbons that would be in the ring, addition of this enolate carbon to this carbonyl would make a six-membered ring. Perfect. Now just to help us keep things straight, I'm going to put a blue dot on the carbonyl that undergoes nucleophilic addition and a bright green dot on the other carbonyl. And I've numbered the carbons so we can track them easily. This is a 3-hydroxy carbonyl compound, and if we heat this reaction, we'll lose water to make the alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. This reaction proceeds well and gives very good yields of the product. We can make 5-membered rings like this, too. Now we have one less methylene group separating the two carbonyl groups. If we remove the alpha proton on the methyl group, we make an enolate, but if that were to add to the carbonyl group, it would make a 7-membered ring. Also not favored. But as we count the carbons at the other alpha position, we see that a five-membered ring would form. During nucleophilic addition to that ketone carbonyl. Five is one of the magic ring sizes, so we see good yields of the aldo product form. If we track the two carbonyl carbons, this one ends up as the carbonyl here, and we'll make this one blue and it ends up with the hydroxyl group on it. When we number in the same way we did on the starting material, these are the way the carbons end up. Again, simply heating causes dehydration. So you might wonder how useful this is really. Well, it's used a lot. And one of the interesting applications, one I want to show you, completes a well-known synthesis of a steroid, progesterone. Progesterone and progesterone analogs are components in the contraceptive pill. I've shown progesterone here on the left. It's a complicated molecule. Steroids have the 6665 cyclic pattern that you see here with a variety of substitutions. And in every stereogenic center, the stereochemistry is very well defined. I haven't shown it here just to keep things simple. The part of the molecule that we need to focus on is this lower left ring. Notice that it's an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And in his synthesis, Professor Johnson at Stanford recognized that this ketone could come from an intramolecular aldol. The compound he would need to use is shown at the left. Treatment of this diketone that has this exact diketone pattern will make a six-membered ring. In this case, 
the carbonyl groups are separated by only three carbons. So it's the enolization at the methyl group that leads to product. Once the enolate is made at this methyl group, it could add to this ketone carbonyl. This closes the ring. And counting carbons, starting with the methyl group, there are six carbons, just what we need for progesterone. This is a really sweet finish to the synthesis, but my gosh, you say, can you really make that diketone? Well, the answer is, Professor Johnson had a clever way of doing that too. He found that he could make the tetracyclic compound on the left. That's got the wrong size ring, but fortunately it has a double bond in just the right place. Cleavage of this double bond with ozone makes a dicarbonyl compound. They're both ketones, just exactly what he needed for his synthesis. There are lots of examples where people have applied in very clever ways this intramolecular aldol condensation to make five-membered rings and six-membered rings.